a long letter explaining to the best I could. Nothing happened. And then perhaps, um, I don't know, three to six weeks later, I got a long letter from him explaining it to me, uh, how it all worked. And uh, I can't tell you I understood his explanation, but I was happy. And uh, that was me. Uh, in any case, it was shortly after Lasers Without Inversion that we got into something called electromagnetically induced transparency. And that's been around about 10 years now. And the point of today's talk is to ask the question, to, uh, to what extent could we take the ideas of electromagnetically induced transparency, which is a means of making resonances transparent, um, making resonances transparent to light and getting very interesting nonlinear effects. To what extent could we take that set of concepts and move them over to matter waves? To what extent can we make matter transparent to matter, make matter go slowly, make matter interact nonlinearly in uh, ways that had not been uh, talked about before? So that's the, that's the objective of the talk. I thought I would, would start with a, a, true, a very concise review of electromagnetically induced transparency. I mean, three to four view graphs just really hitting the highlights. From there, I'm going to go on to a scattering. Um, it's known or, that the properties of matter waves uh, are controlled by, by, by a scattering length. And, and then the general procedure is you, you find the scattering length, you put it into the gross pitievsky equation, and uh, you, know, you know a lot. So in that context, um, if you, if you, excuse me, if you're dealing with electromagnetically induced transparency for light waves, you start with the single atom. You find out what the single atom will do for light waves. You take the result, you put it into Maxwell's equations. Uh, in, the, in the context of today, instead you do a scattering matrix. You find out how one particle will interact with another. You form a, a T matrix. It's really the same, same thing, the S matrix. And you put it into the gross pitievsky equation. So the flow of the, this talk is going to be first a brief review of EIT and light waves, then some discussion of the scattering calculation which was just published in uh, Rapid Communications uh, this month, and then um, telling you about the effect, uh, the, some, um, some predictions of possibly things that one might learn to do using, using matter waves. My co-author is um, a very fine student, Denise Yavuz, who's going to also give a poster on this um, at, at, at ICAP. The, um, so... A little bit about about EIT. Now, e EIT with light waves. I think I would, uh, again, since this is a Fano symposium, I might even start the discussion of EIT with light waves by backing up to the one, really, the one natural case I know of, of transparency in matter in the following sense, that here we have here an energy diagram of neutral zinc with two levels who, though they, have different, uh, the, the, though they appear to be uh, decaying to different continua, when you do the full expansions of these states, they, they decay very much to the same continuum. Um, here's the spectrum as observed by, by uh, Marr and Austin. I believe this must have been at the NIST synchrotron. You could, I'm not certain of that, but anyway, in 69. So here you have, abs here you have absorption. Uh, note how big it is, and that's the point of this. Uh, that is, you have two strong, you have two rather strong lines. That is, note again, ten to, uh, scale 10 to the minus 16. So if you had a cell of this at an atmosphere or anywhere, even 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 a even at a tor, you'll be highly opaque, highly opaque. And you might have, uh, if you didn't know about Fano, you might have expected a Lorentzian line here and a Lorentzian line here. But what you have, since these decay to the same end product, you have a sharp Fano interference of two strong lines and transparency at high pressures and the ability to use a system like this uh, to use resonances for nonlinear optics. So the objective of EIT was can we do this generally in general um, elements? Uh, this is the only strong interference I know. We have loads of Fano interferences, but I don't know where any, any, anyone in anything except zinc that has anything like this, uh, this contrast uh, that, that you have in this. So, so you'd like to learn to do it. And the, 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 so now the key idea of EIT, which is also going to be the key idea of today's talk with Feshbach resonances for matter waves, the key idea for EIT is we simply take um, an, uh, we, we take an, an absorptive transition like this, 
that we would like to make transparent. This thing blinks. I think. Oh, this one. Okay. The uh, take an absorptive transition that um, that has a Lorentzian absorption. The objective is make it transparent. How do you do it? You take a laser or any other RF field, um, and you couple the state, your upper state, to a non-decaying state. The, when I be using the term throughout this talk, non-decaying state, uh, ideal case. This is, this is a, a very metastable state. You couple it. When you couple it with a laser, you, you're in essence dressing this up to the same energy uh, and mixing. So the equivalent system brings us back to zinc. That is, the, the bare atom plus the laser field makes an equivalent atom. And the equivalent atom is two states which decay to the identical state. And thus, one expects that midway between, you will have zero absorption. And when you think about it a bit, you're below one state and above another state. So you expect a steep dispersive profile. And that's your basic, uh, that's the basic idea of what's now called, been called uh, EIT. There's only one other feature I have to acquaint you with of, of EIT and, and to, that bears on today's talk, and that is the constructive interference that goes with it. So, so far I've talked about, so, so far I've talked about a destructive interference of, of radiation here. You put on this and this is your loss, there's your destructive interference. Refractive index I also mentioned for this field. But now let's do something different. Let's, in addition to, or let's ask a different question. Uh, let's put on this control field. So I, we've called it a coupling field. I'll be calling it, some call it a control field. In, ad in addition, let's apply some fields. Don't put on this. This is now going to be generated. But put on these. And now ask, what is the nonlinear susceptibility? Or equivalently, by the way, it turns out to be identical. Ask what's the gain of a laser without inversion. But put on these fields. And now you find that the chi-3, that is this very resonance, which, which is, is, is causing destructive interference here, is causing constructive interference for this process here. And that's key to, to the utility. And the last of the, what I call review, or EIT in light, really you don't have to get much out of this. This, the, the, this, this view graph is supposed to say it works. It really does. Uh, this was a PRL first, and then a, a more practical. Um, numbers are better in this one in optics letters. Nominal 100% conversion at CW power levels from 233 nanometers. These are color-coded depletion from 233 to 186. So you could, so you could do nonlinear optics that you could not otherwise do, just thus giving you a, a, one, one motivation um, for, for EIT. Now there is slow light and, and low light level nonlinear. And there are, there are many others now. So with that background, once again, the theme of this talk is how much of that could we apply to um, to, to uh, cold atoms, and the, um, that's what we're really going to talk about. And the resonance that we deal with in cold atoms is a Feshbach resonance discovered by, at MIT by, um, I don't know who was first, the Ketterly group and then Carl Wyman and his people sort of um, very few years ago, I think, I believe, sort of the same time scale. But in any case, let's, what, what is a Feshbach resonance? Let's... Um, Take a situation where you have two different potentials, for, where you have two different potentials, uh, and, uh, and uh, let us have one potential and some kinetic energy for a free atom out here, and, and tune a magnetic field so the particle who's coming in is, is at the same energy as, the, as this state here. And uh, this is called the Feshbach resonance, and I'd like you to think about it just as if we had an electron, uh, a beam of electrons coming in um, resonant with that thing I was calling an autoionizing state. So an autoionizing state to uh, a beam of electrons in the electronic structure is a Feshbach resonance, the same physics um, over here. And it is known, and I'll, I'll uh, summarize it as a result of a scattering calculation, but it's also known, that, um, well known I should say, that, that the profile, if you now vary this energy, 
of this incoming beam vis-a-vis -vis the the perfect zero over here. You you have a all you, you only have one channel open right now, nothing else. You could only have elastic scattering. You have an, you have a, a Brett Wigner profile of elastic scattering like like so, uh, um, with the the scale of the cross section is is the the Broglie wavelength square uh, for for this. A very large elastic scattering cross section. So I bet you already know, if you haven't uh, heard of this previously, what the idea is going to be. The idea now, of course, is uh, let's take uh, this situation where we have a, a a resonance. We've tuned this up with a magnetic field. Let's put on an RF field that couples to a perfectly stable molecular state. Now, if you have um, heteronuclear, uh, you know, different, uh, what's the right word, anyway, uh, yeah, heteronuclear, th two different nuclei, you could put on, th th there'd be a dipole moment, and you could put on a, an RF field like this. For now, if we're working like with ri rubidium-2, this field would be replaced by Raman coupling. You go up here to a particular electronic state and back down, two-photon Raman coupling. Uh, I'll be showing such Raman coupling as, as a single coupling field. And now you say to yourself, with the, the motivation, as, as I got it, into this somewhere around January, was uh, uh, the let's apply a field, and what I expected to happen did happen. It would split this state into two states, and the incoming beam would be in between. And the result of the calculation I'll show you is now, uh, now the dashed line, the Brett Wigner profile, is replaced by this quantum interference profile. So be, let me pause, be sure you have that, because uh, a lot more to say, but the key idea of creating the interference is once again put on an RF field from the resonant condition to a stable molecular state, there, thereby, splitting, uh, th th thereby splitting the state and creating a quantum interference. Uh, and remember the difference sort of but previously with EIT, we were talking of an interference for light. Here we're talking of, about an interference in the scattering cross-section for an incoming um, electron beam at this energy. I'm sorry, incoming atomic beam, um, an incoming atomic beam at at this energy. Okay. This is like the Speshbach resonance, just with a scattering like this. Vanish. Absolutely, this is. Wasn't the title? Yeah, this is still the title of this. Is subtitle is Feshbach resonance. Right. right. What I'm, we're doing is taking a Feshbach resonance, taking what would be a perfect Feshbach resonance, the dashed curve and applying this coupling field such that the dashed curve becomes the solid curve. So it's a Feshbach resonance uh, exhibiting, a, a, exhibiting a quantum interference. Now, I think maybe it's as easy to explain. Right? That was the motivation. It's easier this way than with formulas. But the, it became clear there was a more interesting problem to solve. And, the, and they'll be showing you that in a moment, but I might as well introduce it here. Instead of having this guy... <coughs> It's be perfectly stable. Let's just solve a more, it's no, no harder really to solve the more general problem where this state lies above and also has a fesh, it has a Feshbach resonance. And here's a better diagram of that. So you see that, so this is now going to be, um, you'll be seeing this, this right hand diagram occasionally as I go along here. This is the problem that I'm solving, the results of which we'll then put into Gross Pidievsky to uh, see the consequences. So, so here I show the second state. Um, below, in fact, this and this don't go together well. This is what I had showed you, uh, and th this is the real problem I'm going to solve. That is, once again, a state which is in Feshbach resonance, an incoming beam which one may tune with regard to that Feshbach resonance, or equivalently leave the incoming beam alone. It's probably better to say and tune this with a magnetic field coupled to another state which also has a Feshbach resonance. And when I get to the applications, the second one's really going to lie above because the most interesting application I could foresee of this right now is to make hot, hot paired condensates uh, exhibiting a parametric gain coupled particles that I'm going to get to at the end of the talk. So the problem we're going to solve are these are once again two coupled Feshbach resonances. Um, 
I wasn't as familiar as I might have been when I started this in January and, de and, and developed the scattering. Um, I just uh, did, did the problem sort of directly from Fano considerations, uh, coupling to the continuum, back coupling. So I worked the problem, I'll be brief, in, in a molecular basis. The, the basis set, if you like, is the molecular basis set in the center of mass system where the, uh, the pertinent states are one, are one molecular state. I have to tell you this because to show you some results, one molecular state, state one, the other stable molecular state, or in general, like so, state two, and free continuum, uh, an infinity of continuum states associated with this state, and an infinity of continuum states associated with this state, like so. You write the coupled equations, and I have to show you that because uh, there's only a few of the connoisseurs here, but, but it's important. Um, People are doing some of this in, let me call it a molecular basis set. And the one thing that you get out of this, doing it just square one, formalism, is that the coupling coefficient on the right side, if this is going to, if the Feshbach resonance is going to be a perfectly elastic scatterer, and if the S matrix is going to be unitary, both of which, all of which must happen, this coefficient and this coefficient are related as shown. They're not, it's not, you can't just throw in some random decay constants on the left side. That is, the, the, the decay constant is an interaction, is the, and you're integrating over an interaction Hamiltonian, is the coupling constant. Uh, with a flat, with an assumption of a flat continuum, they're related like so. Uh, th this this quantity is the driving. Uh, this is this driving b uh, current uh, that you're using to calculate the scattering matrix. So the physical picture of these equations is in comes uh, in comes a, 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 a beam of particles. It excites the molecular state, like so. The molecular state is coupled to the other molecular state, like so. The second molecular state both, decay, both decays out to here and is coupled back to the first state, and you have the free particles that are generated. Now, the reason for going through that, and I'll show you the answer, uh, I'll be very brief here, is what, we're after a parameter called the scattering length. Uh, uh, that is an effective size of an atom, which is the asymptotic value of the wave function at small k. And it's that parameter that normally goes into gross -Bidievsky. We're going to be putting in something a little bit different, but very close to that parameter, which comes from the scattering matrix. So here's the answer. And then I have to tell you about a month or two after I submitted it, I found I could get the, I'll say that first then come back to the answer. I found that I could get this answer by, there's a paper out by John, who speaks tomorrow, John Bohm and, 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 and Paul, uh, the, for a laser assisted collision problem, uh, that involves um, a laser and, and photoionization. Their problem does not involve, um, Feshbach resonance at all, though you could interpret their problem in terms of sort of a man-made Fesh. Anyway, it's a very related problem and most important. I could found I could get my answer from, uh, <laughs> except for the time varying features that I'm going to show you, um, if, excepting for my time varying features, I could get my answer by certain changes of variable in their paper. Now, normally you feel bad when you find your answer in somebody else's paper, but truthfully, I was sufficiently unsure of myself in this problem that I was very happy to find my answer in their paper. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, 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 in any case, uh, the. Um, um, this now is, you can't make too much of this, except it's scattering matrix elements, which are, the matrix is unitary, that's very important, that says the particles coming in here are either elastically scattered or inelastically scattered. These are background phase shifts like so. And now you could use that scattering matrix with the normal definition of scattering length to, to obtain a complex uh, scattering length. I show you very quickly, finish up the consequences of the single atom calculation, and then I go on to the matter waves, the gross Pidievsky. So, the consequences of this uh, scattering matrix calculation, once you have a scattering matrix, once again, you really have everything. Uh, I've, uh, you have the interference I've already told you about that would have gone to zero, but now remember I've done the more general problem where we allow for Feshbach decay here and Feshbach decay here. So now we're interested, and this is what's going to matter in the applications, uh, what's the elastic? 
and what's the inelastic. Say that, be sure you have that. Elastic, you're going to put in a wave. How much of it is going to scatter as an S wave at your same energy that you put it in? Inelastic means how much is going to be translated by this uh, uh, RF frequency. And so you know where this is headed. If this RF frequency lies, uh, let's pretend you go up instead of down. If the RF frequency is a gigahertz, which sort of fits so these things, then um, a gigahertz of energy takes a condensate that has an optical wavelength and moves it to a condensate, oh, I think the 15 angstroms, something like that. That is a gigahertz of energy in terms of condensate momentum uh, creates high momentum and very, very, very short condensate wavelength, and that's where this, uh, this is headed. In any case, you get rather straightforward expressions for the, for the elastic cross-section and for the inelastic cross-section, where these are all very sensible parameters. The k-vector of the incident beam, the decay rates from, from state 1 and state 2, the coupling, the coupling frequency, uh, and most important, in the the equivalent in the EIT, the, remember the nonlinearity or the gain was constructive. It turns out here, as you see, that you have a destructive interference in the elastic cross-section and a constructive interference in the inelastic cross-section, and you have ability to adjust, even staying on line center, you have ability to adjust these, uh, the, these values of the, how much you would like reflected and how much uh, you would like translated in, in, in energy. The other thing that's interesting and might find use, and there are others, there's a Mackie, the Mackie from Finland has a paper. Um, this one's just come out in the rapid communications. He has one in press that's on, on the, in the same spirit. It's on the uh, Los Alamos server. The gist of it, of it is, the question is, could you use this to make molecules, which is a subject of great interest, and the answer is yes. It's rather physical. So um, let's just go through it in words rather than look at the curve. You bring in a, you bring in a beam of atoms, and the question is, to what, 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 given a certain, certain population, let's pretend you have 10 to the 15 uh, rubidium atoms per centimeter cubed, how many molecules could you have? And... Um, the answer is uh, pretty much as much as you want. If, and you, where do they exist? They exist in the stable state. And now let me show you that uh, dynamically. Uh, this is just result, solving those time equations, I, interaction picture time equations I showed you earlier. The, uh, so now then, um, let's show what I have here. First, the coupling field is a function of time shown by the dashed line, hyperbolic tangent-like thing, like so. So first, the coupling field is off. Let's just pause here. The coupling field is off, and in arbitrary units, you have a certain population in the molecular state. The true numbers there are, I'm just from memory, close. At 10 to the 14, you have between one part and 10 to the 3 and one part and 10 to the 4 in the molecular state in, in real numbers. Now you bring up the coupling field. Watch what happens. Um, oh, if I had, I'm going to tell you the ideal case. Let that guy be zero, dead zero. The population in this state goes to complete zero. No longer any population here. Instead, the population resides fully here in the stable state. This guy over, over here. Here, because this is 01, you see it coming down. So once again, this is a means, and I don't know, there may be other ways to do this, but this is a means, uh, you could also do it counterintuitive like we do with atoms, but this is a means to take an atomic condensate and convert it into a molecular condensate by dynamically uh, varying the, the, the coupling field and gradually move uh, all the population adiabatically without loss into the into the stable state, or keep it there, move it back, and 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 so on. So that completes um, everything I have to say. Uh, uh, what do I have? About seven minutes or something? So, okay. Now I now I move. It'll we'll get we'll finish. We move that to matter waves. The question is, how do we translate those results to matter waves? Um, succinctly, I'm going to use a prescription now. Prescription's wrong. Everything's wrong from here on. This is not published, so it could still be wrong. So uh, the the uh, and 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 uh, the the, the uh, 
but I get this prescription several ways that converge by working with molecular states or doing what I'm going to tell you. But for today, it's a prescription. Take the quantity that's normal in the, in the gross Pedievsky that's normally U0 and given by so and replace it by so. Now, this T matrix, I called up, I was stuck on this problem. I called up Pierre. He said, uh, he said Steve, the right word is T matrix. And, uh, and then I started finding it in places. Uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, so the prescription for taking the results of the scattering calculation and putting it into, into gross Pedievsky is first basically, let's just do first the S11 element rather than the general. I'll tell you about the general in a moment. The uh, take S11, subtract one, so you're looking at the change uh, and, 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 re and, and replace, uh, take it in the limit of small k. And I got to talk to you about these limits, what it means. L let me get there in a minute. Put it in, get, uh, do slowly varying envelopes so you could get right to the heart of things. This is a slowly varying envelope equation, and I can now start showing you the consequences both for transparency and for nonlinear optics. So first, these are now we're in the consequences of a certain prescription for moving forward. The, um, Okay, first, let's go back to the case of a pure, perfect Feshbach resonance. Now, zeroth order, first order. What that's about is the following. These are relative Ks. You're doing a scattering calculation. It's K, relative K of the two particles of the center and mass system. Now, all I care about generally is zeroth order if I care about a condensate. But in nonlinear optics, I have to move one condensate into another condensate. And then something called the optical scattering theorem becomes important. And you pick that up in first order in K, as I'm going to explain. So um, the to zeroth order in K, let's start with that, a perfectly dead, uh, perfect condensate. You get this normal... Uh, Scattering length enhancement as, oh, excuse me, pure Feshbach resonance, not EIT. In infinite scattering length over here, no loss because it's perfectly, it's perfectly elastic. Oh, this is important. Define a refract, I'm going to be showing you a define a refractive index that is as you do in optics. Let, 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 the, um, let the wave be exponential i. Refractive index is a function of detuning. Think of it as the magnetic field for now, k zero z. You get an expression for the refractive index. For conditions of a Bose condensate, this is scale 1. And you could, for today, you could think of the refractive index as simply a over lambda. That's rather interesting to me, it, rather, rather physical. That is, the refractive, in, once again, the, this, this scattering length is going to be controllable, and the refractive index is simply the scattering length divided by the de Broglie wavelength, as, and it'll be both real and, and imaginary. Uh, okay, um, for a move, instead of saying first order of K, oh, that says that, interacting condensates. Real part looks the same, but, but the imaginary part is huge. Remember, if this is one, you're dead. You have complete absorption in, in one de Broglie wavelength. You want that number really small, 10 to, the, to get a millimeter. You want 10 to the minus 3 or 4. Okay, next case. Um, the uh, of con EIT, zeroth order, you got the poles, you know, where you've put on your field. No loss. But move the condensate, you've got poles, but now look, the real part's gone to zero. Oh, it's not perfectly zero because I didn't list all the parameters. There's background cross-section in this. And I think I was using a 35 angstrom background cross-section. So the zero occurs off where you have uh, interference of the, of the, uh, against the background cross-section. Now you see, uh, I'll show you this much finer scale, but now there's no absorption. And you have real, real transparency. You could move one condensate through another condensate, and it's transparent. And that here's a here's a blow up on that. And also, um, and and also this I have to mention the optical theorem. Um, so both not both at once though. Uh, so first um, blow up of what I just showed you. The re here's the real part, and here's a, on different scale. But to show here's here's right at the zero. You see very, very good transparency. And these are, re these are the parameters of the uh, MIT group in the sodium, the sodium work in, in, in this uh, not shown. Uh, now, this is really important. Physically, just like in optics, if you, have, if you put a light beam through something and it's scattering the light beam to the side, you have to have an opacity to the plane wave that exactly accounts for the scattering. That in scattering theory is called the optical theorem. 
for reasons bigger than me, it came out automatically. You don't have the chronic chromers or anything or a Hilbert transform. That is, if you just, you, it, exactly, that it just works out. Uh, you do this thing I've told you, and you may show exactly that the imaginary part of K is minus K times the real part square, or if you want that to f more physically, uh, you may obtain this full curve, not, sh not just the little good part here, but the whole thing by nothing more than squaring uh, this curve as per this prescription. And that's just, it had to happen, I guess, but uh, it's, yeah, it's, it, it, it's more than the I guess so. It's still very nice to see it happen. Well, it doesn't, <laughs> well, wait, wait, wait. It depends on order. It does not happen in zero. I guess the surprise to me, at first I was working in zero with order and it doesn't happen, but I guess that's not surprising. Unitarity is not supposed to happen in zero with order. Okay, so that's fine. Um, Okay, now we get to the punch law. Oh, three body loss. Now, what had those had some lunch with Chris? I don't really know about three body losses, but if we take, if I make an assumption and say three body loss is associated with atoms residing in this state, then I've already showed you that the population of this state is going to go to zero, and as you expect, three body loss uh, goes, to, go, goes to zero. I, but Chris tells me that three body in general has to do also with background cross sections not related to the Feshbach resonance. And um, I have no, let me just say the portion of any effect, be it three body or otherwise, associated with this state is eliminated and you still have transparency. So now we come to the hypothetical punchline to finish here. What might one do if one has something like this? Uh, there's actually several things you can do, but here's one that's rather interesting. Um, so, let's start what I'll call a cold condensate. Start, just so you understand where we're headed, start with the condensate at a, at, 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 at a microkelvin, change the units uh, to, 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 to uh, frequency units, and you're at kilohertz. The velocity of a microkelvin condensate <coughs> is... Uh, um, about a centimeter a second in the de Broglie wavelength, this is rubidium, uh, is, uh, is, is 3,000 angstroms. Now, what if you could just change the energy of that condensate by a gigahertz, because that's the spacing of these Feshbach resonances. If you could change the energy by a gigahertz, so now start in this column, now the temperature would be, it doesn't look, seem too hot, 04 degrees Kelvin, but the de Broglie wavelength would be 15 angstroms. So there's motivation to ask the question, are there ways, now I guess there are others. You could drop a condensate, for example, and sufficient, you have, if you had sufficient length, but this, is, this suggests a lot of things. Let me just stay on this theme. So there's motivation to ask the question, could you take a cold condensate and give it, give it, a, give it just a gigahertz of energy? Well, it started that way and calculated the amount you scattered. You could get it all. It's not hard to, to put in a, a condensate here and throw it off as an S-wave condensate uh, at perfect uh, unity efficiency, uh, perfect current efficiency, the, um, like so. But then something more interesting came along, the question of making a parametric oscillator. And it seems to work. I, so let me describe that one to you as my last topic. I've been showing you this like this, but now I want to switch from a, from a relative, um, relative coordinate frame to a lab frame, and the diagram becomes very much like you do with nonlinear optics. That is, the incoming beam is now, um, is now view, I hope I'm making myself clear. The, um, you, you, have an, you have an incoming particle beam, which is represent, and, and here, here it comes, both from the, let's, to conserve, I want to, I must conserve both energy and momentum, and I'm explaining these one at a time. Uh, let's just not do them both at once. Let's look at energy first. So you, 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 have, an, you have an incoming particle beam, you have an, an incoming particle, this, uh, the other incoming particle beam was going to come from the other direction. You're going to translate it in energy by this whooping. This is nowhere near scale. These two together would be, would be way down here, almost nothing. You're going to translate it in energy by a gigahertz up here, and you're going to generate, um, you're going to generate signal and idler parametrically. So the physical process here, you might then use this to make squeezed, uh, squeezed uh, atom beams. So the, the, 
once again, this is in our language pump of an optical parametric oscillator. You're going to come in here and you're going to pump it at this frequency and you're going to, you're going to have uh, exponential gain at the signal and idler. So this is your energy conservation. Momentum conservation uh, is so, like shown, that as pumps coming in like this, notice it says photon momentum neglected. That's really in, in condensate, the photon momentum of this one gigahertz, that's a wavelength of like 10 centimeters and, um, uh, or more. And, and at 10 centimeters, you're going to be doing this experiment on scale a couple of millimeters. You could forget the photon momentum. This is, you know, you don't dare do stuff like this in optical, nonlinear optics. So you could forget the photon. Uh, it's just so small, it just doesn't matter that it's not, uh, there'll be a little recoil, but so what? And, and uh, in any case, so this is your conservation of my, I got it, momentum and, 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 uh, and uh, energy. And then this is simulation of those um, equations. Uh, like so, this is the last few graphs. The, so now you have coupled equations for a backward wave oscillator, just like we used to make in nonlinear optics, signal, idler, loss computed by the, by the uh, um, oh yeah, for the coupling coefficient, it's now T21 divided by K lit in zero with order, like so. So anyway, this is your EIT. Your EIT is getting rid of the loss. I'm sorry, wrong curve. EIT is getting rid of the loss. It's causing a constructive interference in the gain, like so. And the gains for the, uh, s seem very large. The one flaw in this so far is there's a lot of loss at the pump. So you'd have to put it in from the side. But, that's, but in any case, in principle, it's certainly possible. So thank you very much. That was an awful lot.